All right, so let's go over the warm up. Uh, which of the following elements is the most reactive? So getting into metal reactivity. And when you're doing these problems, this is how you want to think about these. Metal reactivity, it increases from right to left on the periodic table. Then as you go down on the periodic table, it also increases. So let's place these elements on the periodic table. Um, radon, RA, is like right there. Uh, or it's not radon, radium. Um, BA, barium, right above it. Uh, MG, up here. And then calcium is right below it. So based on this, what should be the most reactive? <laughs> RA, radium, right? RA, good. So RA is the most reactive. And then the least reactive would be the opposite of that. It would be the highest, though. So be magnesium, MG. So in other words, I don't think this stuff is really that bad. You just you have to keep these trends straight. OK? Um, and then uh, let's do our next set. So we have gallium, potassium, lithium, and calcium. So gallium, we have that uh, kind of over here. Potassium is all the way to the left. Calcium's right next to it. And then uh, lithium is right above. And it's like right here. Okay, so then which of these would be the most reactive? Potassium. Um, yeah, potassium. So I, like, some people last class were saying calcium because that was really reactive in your, your lab. And that, that's true. But like potassium's even more reactive. I can't give you potassium. That would be like too dangerous for me to give you potassium. It'd be too reactive. Okay. Um, so uh, potassium, most reactive. Now uh, this is kind of tricky. What's the least reactive? So uh, it's it's either got to be lithium or gallium, right? Because lithium is furthest up. But then gallium is furthest to the right. So which would it be? And how would you know? Yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Um, gallium, because it's more further. Like lithium, if you like, move it down, you can go to the bottom left corner easier. But gallium can't, because it has to be more. Good. Yeah, it's actually interesting. Way. Lithium could get to the bottom left hand corner faster than gallium. I actually never thought of it that way. Interesting, yeah. Um, another way of thinking about it is like you compare potassium. Lithium is only up above, is one above potassium, but gallium is um, over two, you know, because you got to include all the transition metals away from potassium to the right. Okay? So, in other words, there can be like a little give and take where you have to see like which one is further to a certain side compared to up and down. Those would be the more challenging ones. Whereas the easier ones are like when they're all in the same line or all up and down. Okay, um, so there's the warm up. Now I changed the order of, of some of your slides. Um, I feel like it kind of would make a little more sense. So this was one of the last slides in that section there. Um, so go ahead and find that slide for me. I want to start with this because it, it makes a little more sense to establish this and um, you, you'll, you'll kind of see. So yeah, you'll. It shouldn't be too complicated. Find the, this slide here. It's just like another page or two over. All right, um, and, I've, and I've talked about this, especially in unit um, two when we were drawing the atoms. I told you that a, a shortcut when you're drawing these Bohr models is the period number will tell you how many energy levels there are. If I'm in the first period, I have one energy level. So when you draw the Bohr model, you would just draw one ring. If you then go down a period, you go to period two, you're in the second energy level, you would draw one, two rings. If you're in the third energy level, you would, uh, period three, you would draw three rings, three energy levels. And then, you know, and so on. Okay, so just kind of a, a reminder that that is a thing. Another way of saying this is as I'm moving down, this group, my atom is getting bigger. I'm adding more of these energy levels. Okay. All right, and then um, this 
this is also next to that slide. So I moved this slide up here, the number of valence electron slide. So I, I changed it in the slide deck um, and in the notes and stuff, but I in your the printed off notes, it's further back in there for you. Um, and, I, and I've mentioned this at, at different points this year, uh, but this is kind of like the formal notes part of it. Number of valence electrons is the same as the group number. Meaning if you go one, two, skip the transition metals, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's the number of valence electrons all the elements in that group have. That is a super important concept to understand. Like you just have to get that in your head. And, and I don't think it's a tough thing to memorize. Like it's, you don't even have to memorize it. It's just, it's just understanding how the periodic table is organized. Everything in group one is gonna have one valence electron and group two has two and so on. Now something I want you to add, and, and you'll see it with the, the orange sticky notes on our periodic table, the kinds of ions these form. If I'm in group one, so let me draw a lithium. Bohr model for lithium. Two electrons in that first energy level and one in the second. There's the one valence electron. Lithium wants to lose that one valence electron. Remember, atoms are the most stable when they have a full outside shell of electrons. So it wants to lose that electron. But electrons are negative. If I lose one negative electron, or this really is a negative electron. You just lose that one electron. You're losing a negative charge. So you become positive one. So then if you're a group two, they need to lose two valence electrons, so they become plus two. So go ahead and add that on your slide, plus one, plus two. If you're uh, it's something in group three, you're plus three. Now, um, the, the group four ones, they, they could gain or lose electrons. They don't really form ions. Some places you'll see plus four, minus four. Really for our purpose, I'm not really gonna work with those as ions. Um, but if you're in group five, notice how it changes to minus three. Why do we change to minus three and not go to plus five? And I'll, and I'll draw, like, let me draw nitrogen. Here's the Bohr model for nitrogen. Two electrons and then it's gonna have five valence electrons, why would this become a minus three charge uh, ion and not like a plus five? Perfect, yeah, it's easier to add three electrons, either to add one, two, three electrons, than to lose five. If you gain three electrons, you're then a minus three charge. Really important concept to understand in chemistry. So then these are minus two, minus one, and um, here, what would I do for here? What do you think those would be? These are the noble gases right here. This last column. What kind of ions do you think they form? Yeah, these are the noble gases. If I draw a neon, like let me make this neon. Neon already has a full shell of electrons. So neon doesn't form, and the other noble gas, they don't form ions because they don't need to gain or lose electrons. They're already stable. Okay? Cool. Um, all right. And then um, I moved, sorry to switch the order. I moved this one. This one's more in the middle of the presentation. I moved this up because this is like the summary slide. I thought it might make going over the periodic trends. I just wanted to show you the trends that we're going over, and then I'll go through and explain why the trends are the way they are. So go ahead and fill this in, and I'll explain why they are the way they are. Okay? Now I'm going to add some arrows to this slide. Uh, that way it's like a complete, like this slide will become like, when you're doing that formative later today, this will become like the slide you want to you wanna use. Okay? Um, all right, so... I want to add metallic character or metal reactivity. We said as you go down on the periodic table, metal reactivity, the head of the arrow means higher. So like this is more and the tail is less. So as we go down, metal reactivity increases. Um, now, Metal reactivity is the same thing as a uh, metal reactivity or 
metallic character. Those, they're not technically the same thing, but they travel together. Metal reactivity, how reactive you are as a metal. Metallic character, you know, um, how much do you show the properties of a metal? Those increase as you go down. And then um, as we go to the left, as we said during the warm up, uh, metal reactivity will also increase. So metal reactivity increases the further left we are. And again, that's the same thing as metallic character. Okay. Um, something else I want you to add on there is non-metal reactivity. So non-metals, if metals got more reactive as we went down, Non-metals do the opposite. As we go up on the periodic table, non-metal, NM, non-metal reactivity will increase. I'll just abbreviate it react. Non-metals get more reactive. And then as you go from left to right, non-metals also get more reactive. A lot going on in this slide. I'll go through these one at a time. I just kind of want to start at the end with you. So as you go from left to right, atoms get more electronegative. Electronegativity, that's how badly an atom wants electrons. So as I go from left to right, these elements want electrons more. And um, as I go from bottom to top, they want electrons more. Same with ionization energy. Ionization energy, the energy to remove a valence electron. It takes more energy to remove a valence electron as I go from left to right and as I go from bottom to top. So opposite of metal reactivity. Now atomic radius, this is the same thing as size. So atomic radius, that's the size of the atom. You'll also see it written as like ion size. So ion size, or atomic radius. Basically, how big is the atom? That's going to get, the atom's going to get bigger as we go down the groups. And the further to the left we are, the bigger the atom's going to get. Okay, so I'll let you finish writing then. Okay, so this slide I already added for you on the other one. So this is just showing you metal reactivity and non-metal reactivity. So you um, you added this one already to your other slide. I mean, I don't know if there's a blank for you to write down on it, but uh, it's just saying the same thing. So as we said, as you go towards the bottom left, you get more reactive as a metal. And as you go towards the top right, you get more reactive as a non-metal. All right, now let's understand why. So we talked about metals, and I said metals had a low ionization energy and a low electronegativity, right? We said metals, if I draw the Bohr model of my, uh, my metal atom, so here's lithium. We said that metals want to lose their electrons so they become stable and have a full outside shell, right? That's why they have low electronegativity. They don't want atoms that bad, uh, electrons that badly. 
and a low ionization energy. You know what? They put forth a lot of energy to remove an electron from a metal. Now, if we're talking about nonmetals, the story is the opposite. So here's fluorine. With your nonmetals, they have high ionization energies and high electronegativity because if they could get one more electron, then they will have a full outside shell of electrons. That's why they, they would then be uh, high for electronegativity, high for ionization energy. All right? Way you can remember it, metals are, when they're solid, they're low to the ground. Non-metals are gases, and gases are high off the ground. Okay, now um, I said that as we go from left to right on the periodic table, electronegativity is going to increase. In other words, as you go from left to right, atoms are going to, the, the uh, elements want the electrons more. The reason for that comes back to the Bohr model. As I go, if I look at lithium, lithium doesn't want electrons that badly. But again, you go to the fluorine, what I drew just on that last slide, fluorine wants to get that one more valence electron, then it has a full outside shell. I'll give you a moment to finish writing that down. So it increases from left to right. Okay. Now, as I go down on the periodic table, electronegativity decreases. So as you go from lithium, the very top part of a group, down towards potassium, you get lower electronegativity. The elements don't want the electrons as much. The reason for that is if I am, if I, it comes back to a um, uh, nucleus has what kind of charge? Nucleus, what kind of charge does the nucleus have? Positive, yeah. It's got the, the protons in there, positive, good. Okay? And the electrons have a negative charge. So the nucleus is trying to pull the electrons into itself. It's trying to pull these electrons and shrink the atom. It really wants the electrons. But the issue is if I'm a small atom like lithium, it's easier for lithium to pull the electrons towards itself because there's a, you know, lithium can get at those electrons, those valence electrons easier. But if I'm like potassium, the more energy levels I add, the harder it is for that nucleus to pull on those outside electrons. The harder it is to bring them in. Now ionization energy. Ionization energy and electronegativity, they, they go together. If one's high, the other's high. One's low, the other's low, okay? The reason for, uh, for that is if I am a smaller atom like lithium, this electron is closer to the nucleus, so it is harder for me to pull away that electron compared to, say, uh, fluorine. Fluorine really, really wants its electrons so it's going to be um, a lot easier for me to remove fluorine, or I'm sorry, I'm saying it backwards. Fluorine wants its electrons way more than lithium, so I would have to spend way more energy to remove these valence electrons than I would for something like lithium. Lithium is very motivated to get rid of its electrons. That's why lithium has a very low ionization energy, and uh, fluorine's gonna have a very high ionization energy. So in other words, you don't have to blindly memorize these trends. They, they, they do make sense, like if you can understand what's going on with the Bohr models. Okay. Then as I go down a group on the periodic table, ionization energy decreases. For the same reason as electronegativity, the bigger you are as an atom, the harder it is for that nucleus to pull on those outside balance electrons. Right? These electrons are further away from the nucleus. So for potassium, it's easier for me to pick off those outside, this outside valence electron than it is to pick off lithium's outside valence electron. Just like if you're in the back of the classroom, it's easier for you to goof off than if you're like literally right in front of my face.
All right, now uh, atomic radius. And for atomic radius, we're really talking about the size of the atom. How big is this atom? And it, it, the, the atomic radius will also apply to ion radius or ion size. In the formative, they'll ask you a question about ions. They'll be like, you know, ion size, the ion radius. It's the same trend as atomic radius. And, um, and this picture right here is, it's a really great picture showing you how it works. So if I start with hydrogen, notice how hydrogen is way smaller than cesium. The reason for that is what I showed you on the very first slide today, where hydrogen, its Bohr model just has one energy level. I then then go down to the next period. I go, you know, period two, go to lithium. Lithium would have two energy levels. If you then go down to potassium, or I'm sorry, sodium, sodium's going to have three energy levels. Then go down to potassium, it's going to have four and every time I go down, I'm adding an energy level, so the atom's size gets bigger. And that makes sense, that's kind of intuitive. Now, what is not as obvious is that as I go from left to right on the periodic table, the atoms actually get smaller, right? That's what you can see there. And that's backwards, because you would think that, you know, when you go from left to right, you're adding more protons and neutrons. You would think that would make the atom become bigger, but it doesn't. And I'll explain why that is here in a minute, okay? Um, this is not quite as important. How they, they know the atomic size is, let's say I put two like potassium atoms together. The, the nucleus at the center, that's solid. So if I were to, I can hit x-rays at both of their nuclei, and then the, I can get the distance from the two nuclei, and that would be the diameter of just one atom. So if you were to divide that by two, that would tell you the radius between, from like, from the nucleus to the, the outer part of the atom. So that's just kind of how they figure that out. Okay. Now, um, all right, so going over, uh, so why atoms are bigger, I, and I really kind of already explained this. This is just saying, as you go down the group, you're adding those energy levels. Each time you go down, you add the energy levels. Um, now, something else that's also, um, it's more of a minor role in what makes them bigger, is something called the shielding effect. Meaning, um, there are electrons in all of these energy levels. Well, the nucleus is trying to pull on those outermost electrons. But the more energy levels you add, you know, maybe if I use this diagram, the more energy levels I add, the more electrons there are to shield or block out the, uh, the nucleus from pulling on, the protons in the nucleus from pulling on the valence electrons. It's like in those um, action movies where like, uh, you know, the, there's, like a, there's like a chase and they're like running through a crowd and the person loses the, like the person they're chasing after in the crowd. You know, like these electrons are like the crowd that blocks off the protons trying to pull on those outer electrons. That will also make the atom get bigger. Okay. All right, now this is the one I said that isn't as obvious, atomic size. So as I go from the left, say sodium, all the way to chlorine, the atom's gonna shrink, it's gonna get smaller. Now, the reason for this is sodium, its Bohr model would have three energy levels. Well, chlorine is in the same period. Chlorine is also going to have three energy levels, right? So that you're not adding energy levels as you go across the period. But what you are adding is more positive charge, right? Chlorine is going to have more protons than sodium will. So chlorine has more positive charge pulling on those outside electrons, pulling that atom uh, to make it smaller. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, so you only add energy levels when you go down uh, these groups. So that's why they get bigger as you go down, because you're adding those rings. Yeah. But then here we're moving, we're just adding the electrons to fill the energy levels. But then you're, you're adding more protons, and the added protons have more of a role on pulling up, like they outweigh the 
the pull of the electron so they can pull that atom and make it smaller. Okay. Um, all right, last concept. And this is, a, it, I mentioned this um, in the first lesson of this unit, are diatomic elements. So I told you that the halogens, everything in group seven, they all exist diatomically, like in pairs. And the reason for that was, uh, you know, if I draw two fluorine four models, fluorine's got two electrons in the first, and then seven in the second. So if this fluorine atom can get one more electron, it's going to have a full outside shell of electrons. It's going to be stable. So they want to pair up and share a pair of electrons. It would be like if they're standing on one leg and they're both in balance, but then if they lean on each other, then they would have two legs like between them. Okay, So that's why they exist diatomically. Fluorine, just one single fluorine atom by itself is um, is really uh, is not very stable. Anybody ever heard of free radicals? Free radicals, or something, maybe, or like you'll hear about like oh these berries they reduce the free radicals in your body. Free radicals come about like whenever you get one of these diatomic uh, molecules they 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 become like through some sort of reaction they become just all alone and it becomes super super reactive and it can bounce around and cause damage inside your body. So then we have things in our, in our, uh, in our cells that can um, like basically neutralize those free radicals. And like berries have a lot of those that help like neutralize them. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, okay, so you, gotta, you have to know everything in the bordered red, those are the diatomic elements. You can remember it's the, the L shape. Or I have some different mnemonics for you. Um, there is a Honkelfibber, <laughs> Brinklehoff. Now, Mr. Ecker down the hall, he legitimately like has his class thinking that he has a cat called Brinklehoff. I mean, he doesn't, but like, he like to like you know. Anyways, um, have no fear of ice cold beer. That's interesting. Um, uh, <laughs> I have no brighter, clever friends. That's kind of fun. Uh, anyways, or you could just remember the L. You know, like L. <laughs> anyways, okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah, you can start working on the formative. Uh, 